I'd like to discuss today a little bit about Thanksgiving, its history, uh, where did Thanksgiving originate, is it something that Jews could or should observe, and are there any lessons that we can take out of it? Now, the history of Thanksgiving really begins before the, who would later be called the Pilgrims, came to America. In 1608, there was a disgruntled congregation of English Protestants who moved to a town in Holland where they thought that they could worship the way that they saw fit. They were called separatists, which is a type of Protestant, and they were called separatists because they didn't want to pledge an allegiance to the Church of England, which they believed was corrupt. In Holland, they found religious freedom, but there were some economic difficulties and also a lot of secular influence, so they were not happy there. They decided that they're going to move again, this time to a place without a government interference or any worldly distractions. They were going to go across the Atlantic Ocean to the New World. Now, originally, they were supposed to go to the New World on two merchant ships. One was called the Speedwell, and the other was called the Mayflower. Now, when the boats set sail, the Speedwell had a leak, and they had to go back to port and take everyone who was on the Speedwell and cram everybody on the Mayflower. So you had 102 passengers and cram all their things on as well going on to the Mayflower. And the Mayflower set sail. But because of the delay that was caused by the leaky Speedwell, what that ended up happening, they ended up setting sail at a very, very bad time. Um, first of all, they were all crammed together. And also, to cross the Atlantic at that time was the height of storm season. So needless to say, it wasn't a very pleasant trip. People, the passengers who were on it, were so seasick that many of them couldn't even get up. The journey was horribly unpleasant um, and lasted over the course of a few months. In December 1620, this group of separatists going to the New World to worship God in the way that they understood, the way that they saw fit, in December of 1620, they arrived, uh, first stopping in Cape Cod, and later making their way to uh, a different area in Massachusetts after exploring. So in, in December of that year, they reached the place that was called by one of the explorers on the ship, John Smith, Plymouth, Massachusetts. Why was it called Plymouth? Because that's where the Mayflower had originally set forth from in England. So everyone agreed, this is Plymouth, Massachusetts. They landed there, December 1620. Now, when they got there, life was not very easy. They had a very, very difficult winter, uh, and they suffered also. There was plague in the area, and very, very difficult weather conditions that also killed many local Native Americans at the time. The colonists spent their first, their first winter living on board the Mayflower for safety. By the following fall in 1621, 46 of the men, so basically half of their, the people that they originally came with, uh, had died because of either pneumonia or scurvy. Without the help of the area's native people, uh, it was likely that none of the colonists would have survived. First, they met a native named Samoset, and later he introduced an English-speaking native named Squanto, who helped the settlers throughout these, uh, throughout these months. They taught them how to cultivate corn and beans, squash, how to extract sap from uh, maple trees, how to catch fish in the river, and to hunt local animals, and how to also avoid poisonous plants. They also helped the settlers to forge an alliance with the, uh, the Wampanoags that, were, that was the local tribe at the time. And that alliance 
that they had forged lasted for about 50 years. And unfortunately, that is one of the only times that the settlers who came over to the States had a sort of long-standing agreement uh, with the local Native American tribes. So after this time had passed, you know, so almost a year later now, by the fall of 1621s, uh, the pilgrims of the time elected a governor among, from among them, named his name was William Bradford, and he, celebrating the, the harvest that they had come about, decided that they're going to make a day of thanksgiving, celebrating thanks for the harvest. And this celebration actually lasted for three days. Now, they also invited the, the local uh, Wampanoag tribe, and the, 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 the chief of the tribe, and 90 braves, 90, uh, 90 participants in the tribe, to celebrate this feast of Thanksgiving, this first Thanksgiving meal. So there is some, there's some speculation to actually what was on the menu of that first Thanksgiving meal. Was turkey on the menu? Mm, I don't know. It says in Governor Bradford's uh, diaries, his, uh, his history, that he made what was going on, that he sent some men out fowling and that they brought back many wild turkeys. But in 17th century um, pilgrim jargon, the term turkeys had a much broader meaning than it does today, and turkeys, bringing back wild turkeys, could have just as easily meant duck or swan or uh, geese. So it's unknown whether actual turkey as we know today was even on the menu of the original Thanksgiving. We do know we have more reason to believe that there were deer because the, the chief, uh, the Wampanoag chief sent out some of his braves, and it says that they brought back a few deer to, um, to General Bradford. So it's much more likely that deer was on the menu. Now, turkey's integration into our Thanksgiving meal actually came quite a bit later. Um, for instance, in, in the mid-1800s, there was a collection of recipes from the Ohio housewives called Buckeye Cookery. And this is, again, mid-1800s, and it suggested a bunch of traditional Thanksgiving-type dinners, Thanksgiving-type recipes, and many of them ignore turkey completely. So it made its way in uh, much later to turkey. Pumpkin pie probably was not also on the original menu with, the, with these uh, pilgrims. Um, they probably did have boiled pumpkin, but not the pumpkin pie that we all love uh, today. Um, many people actually attribute the trimmings of the Thanksgiving meal with turkey and stuffing and cranberry, all the things that people talk about, uh, to a, a woman named uh, Sarah Josepha Hale. Sarah Josepha Hale was an editor of a Boston magazine, very popular, very popular writer. In fact, many people know of her but don't even realize that they know of her. She's the uh, writer of the poem, Mary Had a Little Lamb. So um, they attribute all of our, our current Thanksgiving meal that people associate in America with Thanksgiving to her. Why? Well, she was very patriotic and she lobbied Congress and many of the new presidents who would come every time there was a new president, she would lobby them as well to make a national day of Thanksgiving, to make it an official national holiday. And at the same time, she wrote novels that romanticized turkey meals in an over-the-top drooling type of way, this lavish meals. And eventually, she was, she was the cause of, uh, that motivated Abraham Lincoln to an, eventually make Thanksgiving a national holiday. And it seems that the, the two, the Thanksgiving holiday and the, all the trimmings that come with it of the meal kind of came together largely because of her. So how did it, how did it become a national holiday? How did it move from colonial times to American national holiday that we know today? Um, after the pilgrims had that original meal, they had one two years later uh, marking the end of a long drought. 
And then there would be days of thanksgiving from then on, on occasion. It wasn't a, a yearly set thing that everyone in the nation, uh, that all the colonies would, would celebrate. It was a, done on occasion for various different uh, things to celebrate in all of the New England settlements and the ideas spread as well, but nothing concrete that everyone was doing. In, in 1777, um, after our founding, the first, that was the first time that all 13 colonies in the United States all celebrated one day of Thanksgiving. They joined together to celebrate the victory over the British at the Battle of Saratoga. It was the first time that all the colonies together were celebrating one day of thanks. But again, it was a one-time affair, and from time to time, uh, people, different states, uh, uh, would would um, would have their own celebrations, but nothing nothing on a national scale. In 1789, George Washington issued the first Thanksgiving proclamation by the national government of the United States. In it, he called upon all Americans to express gratitude for the happy conclusion of our War of Independence and for the successful ratification of the United States Constitution. Just to quote a little bit from the proclamation, it says, I do recommend and assign Thursday, the 26th day of November next, to be devoted by the people of these states to the service of that great and glorious being who is the beneficent author of all the good that was, that is, and that will be, that we may then all unite in rendering unto him our sincere and humble thanks for his kind care and protection of the people of this country. So, it wasn't meant to be a religious holiday per se, but there's certainly certain religious undertones. Certainly, God is mentioned. It's not mentioned in, as a specific religion's God, but the God figure and God's uh, overseeing of this nation. Later presidents, John Adams and James Madison, also... Um, assigned days of thanks during their presidencies. There was, again, nothing clear year by year designated to all the states quite yet. In 1817, New York actually became the first of several states to adopt a, an official Thanksgiving annual holiday every year, certain day. And then um, each, each state would subsequently um, also assign, you know, each state also subsequently assigned different days to have his Thanksgiving. They would each do it on a different day and in a different way. Um, also, this was mainly in the north. A lot of the southern states were unfamiliar with this custom. In 1827, Sarah Josepha Hale of Mary Had a Little Lamb fame fought tooth and nail for 36 years for a national holiday. She really wanted this national holiday. She published numerous editorials, sent scores of letters to governors, to senators, and even each uh, president. In October of 1863, Abraham Lincoln finally heeded her request. At the height of the Civil War, he entreated all Americans to celebrate a day of thanksgiving and praise to our beneficent Father who dwelleth in the heavens to commend to his tender care all those who have become widows, orphans, mourners, and sufferers in the lamentable uh, civil strife, and also to heal the wounds of this nation. Again, not a religious holiday in the sense of ascribing it to a particular faith, but certain religious connotations uh, mentioning God. He scheduled Thanksgiving for the last Thursday in November, and it was celebrated on that day every year uh, since. Uh, parenthetically, it's interesting that in 1939, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, in the midst of uh, war and depression, was pressured by some of the retail industry to push back the national holiday of Thanksgiving one, one Thursday before. That, they would, that way that there would be extra time, retail time, between Thanksgiving and the so-called holiday season give it to people extra time to buy and shop and, and whatnot. It was fought with a lot of opposition. Uh, people who were against it called it 
Franksgiving, and Franklin rose it up. Um, and in 1941, he admitted that it was an error in judgment and returned it to where it is today, the last Thursday, the fourth Thursday of uh, November. Um, so how does this play out for Jews? What's meant to be, as Jews, our outlook of Thanksgiving? We know where it came from. We know the history. How should we go about it? So before we get into the specifics of Thanksgiving, I'd just like to review a concept that we've discussed once before. And that is the laws that we have in Jewish law, codified in Jewish law, about against um, hukat akum which are the statutes, the customs of our neighbors, of our Gentile neighbors. Now, just a little disclaimer, and this disclaimer is actually made by the Divrei Chaim in his responsa literature. And he says that the intent of these laws is not to cause leniency in respect shown to our neighbors, as it's clear by the fact that many sages had very close relationship with non-Jews and noblemen. However, there must be some mental safeguards and distinctions to keep our mission and responsibilities in this world as clear as possible. So what these laws are meant to do are not to make us disrespect our neighbors or the nation that we live in, but just to, in order to preserve who we are. They're based on various verses from the Torah, from the Bible, that discuss not going in the statutes of the surrounding country that you're in, the surrounding land, people that you're in. There's a discussion in the Rishonim and the Achronim, the early sages and the later sages, as to what exactly the parameters of Chukat Akum really are. Everyone agrees that if a custom develops that is idolatrous, or that is immoral, that Jews obviously have to distance, them, distance themselves from it. The Ran and the Ma'arik say that it, essentially um, going away from idolatry is the prohibition, that's avoiding idolatrous practices, but other practices may be okay. Tosfos in the Talmud, in the Gemara and Avayda Zara, says that even a minig shtus, even an irrational custom that comes up, not even idolatrous, but even an irrational custom that develops is also prohibited under this law, this mandate of, of not going in the ways of our neighbors. Contemporary rabbinic scholars use these ideas as premises for how we should approach Thanksgiving in America today. Each one has a different perspective, really dependent on how is a Thanksgiving meant to be celebrated? Is it a completely secular holiday or does it have certain religious connotations? So there's essentially three perspectives that are taken. One is that we should ignore it completely, one that we should recognize it, and one that um, we should perhaps even celebrate it, depending on where you fall in the spectrum. Let's talk about the most stringent is attributed to Rav Hutner. Rav Hutner was the Rosh Hashiva, the Dean of the Masifta Chaim Berlin. And he said that regardless of the motives of Thanksgiving, uh, the first Thanksgiving in the 1600s, making an annual holiday based on the Christian calendar is not something that a Jew should be involved with. Rav Hutner argues that such a celebration becomes a holiday through annual observance marking that day. And celebrating a non-Jewish holiday is wrong, according to him. Rabbi Menashe Klein and Rabbi David Cohen of New York, also contemporary scholars, lean towards prohibition of the celebration as well. They say even if it's not because of idolatrous associations, at least because it's a it's an irrational, cool, uh, an irrational rule, an irrational custom that has been developed and uh, should be shunned for that reason. I heard also in the name of Rabbi Victor Miller, who spoke very strongly against eating turkey on Thanksgiving because it was uh, clearly in his mind something that was uh, a non-Jewish custom that had no rationale, that something that a Jew should not be involved in. So that's the most extreme view. Then you have Rabbi Moshe, Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, who 
uh, passed away in the 1980s. It's a tremendous, uh, tremendous scholar, world-recognized halachic authority, Jewish legal authority. And he has four published responsa on this topic, at least four, four that I'm aware of. He says that it seems that Thanksgiving has no religious content, and also says that the celebration is irrational and would thus be prohibited because imitating a secular society. However, it seems that this prohibition is if, is if you're doing celebratory rituals that are associated with actually celebrating Thanksgiving, but may not apply if you're merely eating a meal. So in his, in, in his perspective, a generic Thanksgiving, a generic uh, celebration on Thanksgiving would be okay, even though he also uh, stresses that a bal nefesh, someone who's meticulous in their Torah observance, should be strict and not do it. But uh, to actually make a celebration in honor of Thanksgiving would be prohibited. So generic celebration, generic get-together, eating food, not prohibited, but to make an actual Thanksgiving celebration, he says, is more of an issue. If nothing else, because of it being an irrational law, an irrational statute. Uh, he said, eating turkey, but, but however, eating, just eating turkey on Thanksgiving uh, may not be such an issue. Uh, Rabbi uh, Freim Greenblatt also says a similar, that eating turkey on Thanksgiving is not an issue. And the last is the most lenient view of Rabbi Soloveitchik, who it's been said in his name that he found it difficult to comprehend how one can consider Thanksgiving to be a Gentile holiday or that it was prohibited to celebrate it. Um, it's known also that he would, in fact, on Thanksgiving Day, give, give his lectures early in order to allow people to go home to eat their Thanksgiving meals with their family. And it's said that he even would go home to Boston to celebrate Thanksgiving uh, with, his, with his own family as well. So those are the basic legal parameters of how a Jew should approach Thanksgiving, what a person should practically do for themselves. I would consult your local competent rabbi to discuss these issues and to see how it fits in your, in your life. Now, without mentioning the, the legal status, per se, of Thanksgiving, um, the Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, praised America as a country that's being founded on God as the overseer, as being a country that's benevolent to the Jewish people. And he also loosely linked Thanksgiving and Hanukkah in a Febring, and, and the Febring and the Gathering is recorded. A person can watch it uh, probably even online. So what about Thanksgiving and Hanukkah? Everyone's making a big deal this year that they're overlapping. Does their proximity have any meaning? Do they share a common thread? And is there a particular lesson this year that we can learn from the fact that they overlap? So in my mind, I believe there are two things that Hanukkah and Thanksgiving share, two concepts. The first is obvious, the idea of gratitude, Thanksgiving. The Talmud, the Gemara and Shabbos, says that when the Hanukkah miracle occurred, it says that they were able to light the menorah from a flask of oil, and that lasted eight days. And then the next year, they established it, made it a holiday, filled with thanksgiving and praise. Jews are known for their praise and thanksgiving, their obligation to give praise and thanksgiving to God. In fact, there are certain laws there's a law in Judaism that when a person undergoes a certain difficult situation, he has to make a special blessing called the Birkat HaGomel to thank God, to praise God for helping him get through that situation. One of the other ways in which we give thanksgiving and praise, besides that actual blessing, is in the Psalm, Psalm 107, is one of our praise and thanksgiving psalms. In fact, the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of the Hasidic movement, instituted that every Friday, every Friday evening, just before Shabbos, just before the Mincha prayer, we say Psalm 107, a Thanksgiving Psalm, thanking God, praising God for getting us through the week. 
something that's interesting, little known fact about Thanksgiving or what led up to Thanksgiving, when they landed here in the New World, they recited Psalm 107 in Thanksgiving to God for helping them get across the sea. Nick Bunker, an author, an historian, writing about this topic, says the reason that they chose that Psalm 107, which is a Jewish Psalm of Thanksgiving, is because the Bible that Bradford brought with him across the ocean to the Americas contained a commentary that included the Jewish concept of Birkat HaGomel, written by Maimonides. It was in his Bible, in his Bible translation and commentary that he brought across with him. So they said Psalm 107, a Jewish Thanksgiving Psalm, right when they got to this country, right when they got to this nation. So gratitude, Thanksgiving, is certainly a common denominator between Thanksgiving and Hanukkah. But maybe a step further. The pilgrims, they left England because of discomfort with how they were allowed to serve God there. And they went to Holland to, to seek out a better life. Why did they leave Holland? Why did they come to the New World and not just stay in Holland? One of the primary reasons was because of secular influence. They didn't like the secular influence that they had in Holland. They were free to worship as they wished over there. They had the freedom, but secular influence was still so strong that they, didn't, they couldn't take it. And they wanted to be off by themselves in the new world where they wouldn't be distracted or bothered by, by these secular influences. So they came across the sea to the new world and wanted themselves also to be a light and a light to the nations as well. The Mayflower pilgrims and their descendants remained convinced that they alone had been specifically chosen by God to act as a beacon to the rest of the world. Bradford writes in his diary, in his history of the Plymouth, of, uh, Plymouth Plantation, says, as a small candle may light a thousand, so the light here kindled hath shown to many, yea, in some sort to our whole nation. They, to, they saw themselves as a light to the nation and in, in a greater sense as a light to the entire world. I believe the idea of light, spreading light, being a light, is a very strong and powerful theme of Thanksgiving as well. The whole precursor, what led up to the whole Thanksgiving celebration, was seeking to spread light and serve God without secular influence. Something that's interesting The Baal Shem Tev, the founder of the Hasidic movement, teaches us that everything that we see and that we hear, every experience that we have, is a potential lesson of how to make our connection with God stronger, how to make it better. When he taught this principle to his followers, to his disciples, they went out and decided they were going to try it out. They looked for a situation that they could learn how to serve God better through seeing something or hearing something. So they left, they're walking around, and they saw a man carving in the snow the shape of a cross. This is a known story. In the snow, right there, carving a cross. And the disciples were very confused. What, what possible lesson of, our, of, of a Jew serving God could we possibly learn from a cross being carved the cross being uh, carved out in the, in the snow. So they went back to the Baal Shem Tev and asked him, Master, please enlighten us. What is the message? What's the teaching? How can I serve God better based on this, based on this uh, sighting? So, so Baal Shem Tev taught them something very interesting. He said, when a Jew's service of God, when our enthusiasm in Torah is not there, a person doesn't have a fire, doesn't have the, the light and lets their service of God be cold and frigid. It can become so cold and frigid that it leads to abandoning faith. 
and turning to another faith. We have to make sure that our faith and our Torah and our learning is always full of heat and light and passion and intensity. So sometimes from situations or from people, incidents, we can learn how to, how to serve God better from a place that we wouldn't necessarily think to look to learn something. The Chidushe Harim says about missionaries that if we would work with the same enthusiasm and sincerity and diligence in matters of truth as they work in their matters, we would be very successful people. We always have to take what we see and we hear, that which is available to us, all the incidents that occur to us, and try to think about them in a way that maybe helps us serve God a little bit better. This was the teaching, the message of the Baal Shem Tov. Aside from Hanukkah, excuse me, aside from Thanksgiving being a day of light, these people who came to, the, came to America to avoid secular influence and to be a light to the nations. Sounds a little familiar about Hanukkah as well. After all, what's the whole holiday of Hanukkah celebrating? The celebration of light over darkness, of the light of Torah, the passion of Torah over secular influence. In our history as Jews, we've been subject on many occasions to oppression by the nation, the host nation that we were living with. Now, oppression has come in two forms. One is active oppression, where they want to hurt or kill Jews. They do not want you to live. Physical death. The other, which happened in the story of Hanukkah, was that the Greeks didn't want the Jews physically dead. They just wanted them spiritually dead. We won't kill you. We don't care about taking your life. Have your culture, have your customs, but be one of us. Assimilate with us. Be a Greek Jew. Nothing wrong with that. And the real victory of Hanukkah, of light over darkness, that took place was the passion of Torah, the light of Torah, which will always be there over secular humanism. This year, Hanukkah and Thanksgiving fall on the same day. Hanukkah is Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is Hanukkah this year. Is there a special lesson, perhaps, that can be gained? Or a, or a point, maybe, that's being emphasized? I'm not claiming to know the answer. But it was a lesson that meant something to me that I'd like to share with you. A few months ago, there was a study that many have heard about, the Pew study, which showed the progress or the, the outlook. Is Judaism on the rise? Jewish life on the rise? Jewish excitement on the rise? And the results, whether they're accurate or not, is a different story, but the results tend to point that things seem pretty grim. Things seem pretty dark. I don't think that it's a coincidence that in the same year, within the proximity of a few months, you have Thanksgiving and Hanukkah. Thanksgiving, a day that everybody celebrates, even the most secular of Jew. Hanukkah, a day that everybody celebrates, even the most secular of Jew. With one common mission and one common idea, light triumphs over darkness. The light, the passion of Torah will always be there. It also reinfuses us to reconnect with our overall mission in this world to be a light to the nations. And even the secular holiday that we're celebrating, what's the key message behind it? Be a light to the nation around you. Be a light to the whole world. 
As Bradford said, just as one candle burns here, so too a thousand burn elsewhere because of it. We as Jews, the message of Hanukkah and the message of Thanksgiving this year, should utilize the opportunity, realizing that Judaism will never die. Light will always triumph over darkness. And use it as a time to galvanize within ourselves the passion, the heat, the intensity, the fire, the light that we have within us as Jews to illuminate the world around us. Click subscribe to see more exclusive content for the most sought-after Jewish speakers, teachers, and thinkers.